I, asked, I was asked to make this quite practical, so there are some tips about what to do to engage best with the media, um, as, as I've seen it. But also, um, I want to cover the two areas, which is first the kind of proactive stuff. How do you get interesting research that you've done, report findings out there? How do you get maximum pickup? But also the reactive stuff. How do you engage with a journalist who phones you out of the blue? or someone who's seen some previous work that you've done and how might, you know, what would be the tactics you might best employ. Um, I think the first thing I really want to stress with all of this is that as journalists, most of us come, even if we become specialists in a particular area, we come to it as non-specialists. Um, and people, I edited two different business publications in the social housing world, which were weekly publications. Um, it was very rare that I could recruit anyone with professional background in the area, and certainly even rarer, I think there was one who had any policy research background themselves. Um, my own background was in modern languages, and, and apart from having done a couple of interviews over the years in, in French and German, you know, I just don't use it at all. I didn't know much about social policy research per se. Um, my mother worked at a housing association, so that was my interest, and I became sort of rapidly very interested in, in the social housing world. Since going freelance, I've expanded that, so I now cover um, health policy, social care, older people, dementia, a um, few areas like that. So I wanted to show you... Um, Firstly, some examples of, these are some of my recent stories, you, you won't be able to read them, but the, as I say, prompts for me really, to, to show the kind of um, uh, interaction between journalists and academic, academic researchers. Um, the one on the, on the left here, the dementia story, that's a very recent story about some work that the University of Stirling Dementia Research Centre um, have been doing and it's an ongoing project and it's quite interesting because it's something they clearly wanted some coverage for at this stage one to time with the conference that was running two because it is still ongoing and it's it's online research it's a survey based piece of work um, and you know the coverage is obviously encouraging more people to take part in that so they were giving us a snapshot of where they were with some of the findings at that stage um, this one, and it, this, this might be something that, that you, know, you kind of come up against, it was actually a commercial commission, a commercial firm commissioning some research. And it's the sort of thing that The Guardian just wouldn't have covered unless it had some sort of authority of a, of a good academic name alongside it. Um, this one on the other side, um, that's just a screenshot from online, but it was actually a really significant piece in the paper. It made the lead on Society Guardian with a number of case studies and it was um, something that, that, that shows the benefit of something I'll talk about which is working in advance to, to gear a publication or a journalist up for something. This was a two year study, two universities involved, a number of hospitals and health trusts and they told us about it in advance. We could work up, it was about, uh, I mean it's um, one of the first of its kind um, at such scale, looking at older people um, living with HIV. And because they liaised with us, and we could work both on their findings, but also we could set up to talk to some people who were affected and run a number of case studies with people who they, um, some of whom I found myself, some of whom they approached on, on our behalf and talk about covering that in a sensitive way. So, um, obviously, positive outcomes for them. This is something that I did recently for um, a magazine called Modus, which is put out by RICS, the Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyors. And they asked me to um, do a comparative piece about how different countries are tackling the shortage of affordable homes. So they wanted the UK in there, uh, they wanted China and Australia, uh, Australia, I think I suggested to them. Um, now, I went to people, you know, without them approaching me on this. So it's, uh, I, it's this reactive thing. I'm phoning someone up and saying, can you help me with this? I knew very little about affordable housing in China. Um, the professor had written a recent report for RICS on 
um, on that, and who's at Oxford Brooks, gave me a huge amount of his time. But obviously, it was a very positive piece in showcasing some of the work that, that he had done. Um, and in Australia, um, just to illustrate that, that ongoing links and relationships can be really helpful, um, there's a professor that I knew who, when he worked at Harriet Watt um, in the UK, who's now in New South Wales, who again gave me the benefit of his insight into what Australia is doing. Um, so, just to talk about some of well, the benefits, I mean, I don't need to spend long, long on this. I think we all know why you would want to get stuff out there. Um, this is stuff from Inside Housing that, that I used to edit. We picked up on academic research a lot. We built links with particular um, organisations, with particular individuals. We used them as columnists, and therefore there's a, there's a real profile in there. Um, if you don't, this is another organisation that I do some work for. They're called Housing Quality Network. They are a consultancy and a sort of support network for um, uh, individual organisations in the housing sector who, who pick up on their expertise in particular areas of the field, like you know rent collection, assets, that kind of thing. They've they've launched this project, which I think is quite an interesting. One, it's because academic research isn't getting out there enough, they do this regular bulletin. They're supported via various uh, academic institutions to do so, to showcase some of the work. And I think that's in a way a positive thing, but it's also a negative because it shows that if you're not able to get it out there, that's going to be going out, you know, someone like myself might read it, but some of the national papers, some of the wider media that you might who you might see as your target audience are just not getting it and it's ending up in a, in a kind of regular bulletin like that. Um, so in terms of going in with your eyes wide open, I, I'm sorry about the dreadfully cliched academic there, that's from um, Inside Housing and it's a, a really interesting piece where they sent someone along to um, the Housing Studies Conference, 500 or so people, I think, um, in Edinburgh. Um, no um, policy makers, no politicians there at all, purely academic. And I think you know, it, it shows the problems in making those connections between um, policy makers, politicians, the media is the kind of go-between um, when you've got something like that with, with people from all around the world and yet it's not getting the, the pick-up. So the number one clearly is getting um, the media's interest to, as a way of reaching beyond that. Um, but if you do do that well, obviously you have to relinquish control and I think it's really important to be aware of that when you're putting stuff out there. Journalists as I said, are journalists first rather than policy experts. They may develop a certain degree of, of expertise, but they are going to use it in the way in which they see fit. Therefore, you need to think about how you present it to them in the first place so that any ambiguities are, are you know, lessened from your perspective. Um, amongst those, obviously, oversimplification. I mean, we, we are not the policy experts. You need to present it in a way that minimises the risks of oversimplification. If it would be easy to make a, a, a simple mistake by oversimplifying, then you know, the output in the first place to the journalist certainly needs to address that. Um, context, I think, you know, is always a danger. Journalism is, by its very nature, selective they will choose from your piece of work or your press release that you carefully craft the most interesting from their perspective. And you can't always predict what that might be. We'll, we'll have a very quick look at, at forming a press release um, in a minute. But you know, even with the effort that you put in, it might be something you've put halfway down that's the thing that they choose. Um, and similarly, pick up by others. You may address... Um, something you want to get out there to the specialist press or to Society Guardian 
but you can't control it, whether that's then picked up by the Daily Mail or you know someone with a very different agenda. And I recall doing a story um, about some culturally sensitive housing, and there were some great projects, there were some really good stuff, you know, with, with, with stuff adapted specifically, I think, to older older people from um, specific communities. And there was some research that had been done looking at the impact of that. And then, you know, naturally that that made a, a positive story in some areas, but when the Daily Mail picks it up, it wasn't a positive story for anyone involved, including, you know, the people who had done the, the supporting research. So I think you need to be aware of that. It doesn't mean don't do it, clearly, but it does mean just think about how some things might be perceived by people with a different agenda. Um, so on a more positive note, what, what journalists want and why they're coming to um, researchers, Firstly, obviously, content. I mean, the 24-7 news agenda means there is incredible scope and amount of space to fill. Good stuff will, you know, um, will be welcomed, um, depending on where you're, you're pitching that at. Um, they want the authority. We want the authority of, of what you'll be able to tell us. And it may well be something, an issue of concern that we've been looking at, but to be able to have that authoritative and considered and studied approach is, is um, um, you know, what journalists will be very keen on. They'll also be keen on um, exclusivity, and by that I mean if you're preparing something um, to put out for publicity, um, you may well often be asked, have you approached anyone else? And depending on what it is, you may well want to specifically pitch it at one publication because they, they are then perhaps likely to say, we'll go bigger on it because we've got it just for us. Um, that, that competition is there the whole time, whether it's at a, a specialist weekly or whether it's in, in the nationals. Um, you need to make it easy for journalists. Um, they haven't always got the, the time or the appetite um, to do their own legwork and the easier you can make it the better for them, for you, because you, you have a little bit more of control over the ultimate end product. Um, and they also need access to people, and that means easy access to you once you put something out, but it also means you know they're going to be looking for the human interest a lot of the time. And if you can facilitate that, obviously with the appropriate um, caveats around sensitivity, then that's incredibly helpful. Um, so what do you do overall, I mean, when, once you're starting out on a project that you are looking to get out into the public arena, um, you need to be thinking about which outlets you might use, and within that, looking at the, the key journalists, it's, it's really no good just sort of bombarding it out and saying, you know, to the Guardian news desk or something, because they'll just, it will just get um, sunk under a pile of, of other stuff. Find out who's looking after that particular area? Are there particular specialist publications that you want to target? If so, look at who has the brief for whatever your, um, you know, whatever the area is. Um, social media is incredibly important, both for you in identifying people that you can't easily get hold of. I mean, there are all sorts of media databases, but some of them cost to get access to the right contact names. So social media is actually a really good way to circumvent that. And a lot of people come to me directly via Twitter, for example, and say, you know, have you seen this? Are you interested in that? And also I use it as a research tool myself. So I follow an amount of people who I know are doing interesting things and can create a conversation with them. And even if I don't use whatever they're putting out right at that moment, I know that if I'm writing something in that area, I can, I can go back to them. Um, if you're putting out a, a press release in particular, um, so this is, this is very much on the proactive side, um, just a few obvious guidelines I'm sure, but you would be surprised at how many, um, not just in the research field, but, but wider than that, people with huge PR and marketing budgets just don't have these basic things right as in what are you saying, and you really need 
to be able to craft a, a, a pitch or a press release, a handful at most of key messages. So if you've got a really wide overarching project, you just need to narrow that down. What are your key messages? What are you going on at this stage? Because anything more and, and you know it becomes something where, where people take one look at it and not really clear where you're going with it. Who's your audience? Obviously that's clearly there's there's a, a, a different level of interest and different messages for um, a, a specialist publication for a national like The Guardian and even different again for a tabloid. Um, is it clear um, Remember that, there, you know, if you are putting out an individual piece of research, a research report, they're unlikely to read the whole thing. They'll definitely want to have a look at the executive summary, but they'll want to have access to the whole thing. Because otherwise, you know, there's a question of, well, what else is in there that I'm missing? They might not read it all, but they might. Um, and this is just a very quick illustration of, of how to do it. This is, this is how we're taught when we're trained. I, I was trained on, on regional papers and, and there's a pyramid structure for how you write a story. And it's the same, this is for a press release. The idea being you cut from the bottom. So, um, you know, you really need to go in with a, a good heading, a good hook line, um, follow it up in the middle with some named designated quotes that are, are pithy, you know, it doesn't need to be the, the wildest controversial soundbite in the world, but it needs to be pithy, interesting in its own right. And then at the back, any th uh, uh, at the bottom end, anything that's kind of nice to know, but not absolutely desperately um, necessary. Um, and how to do it? Well, clarity, jargon-free where possible, even with people who become you know, who've written about a particular um, policy sector for some time don't want to be um, writing a story in that way. It's not going to work like that, so you need to be able to, to express it in a, in a jargon-free manner. Um, for Society Guardian, for example, the idea we are, we are writing for and talking to policy professionals, social care professionals, health professionals, but the idea is the piece will be read by the readership as a whole. So there's no assumptions about what, not, what prior knowledge people might have. Um, and the bottom one's quite an important one. Don't sort of send out sort of 55 bullet points of different interesting stats in there. Choose the, the real killer ones that, that you think are key, because things, you know, the, the more stuff you've got in there, and particularly if there's ambiguity, there's always ambiguity, isn't there? But take the ones which are most representative so that there's no risk of confusion with you know, far too many stats. And then once you've got something out, what happens next? You might find that, as in the example on the right, that looks to me, that's not my story, but that looks to me like that's come from a press release, new piece of research for crisis commissioned by Sheffield, um, by Sheffield Hallam, commissioned by Crisis, and they've just taken it from the press release and, you know, just pulled out the, the main finding from the press release, um, probably further details, you know, this is where you can get hold of the full report, and that's the end of it. They haven't come to you for further comment. But it, it may well be that that sparks an idea like this one, you know, um, let's do a further feature... Let, if you make yourself available, it may become the basis for a much more substantial piece. Um, managing expectations. This is for both the sort of proactive and the, and the reactive stuff, really. Um, ask what the journalist deadlines are. Um, make sure that, that um, you are available to come back to them within that time. But don't feel that if someone rings you either for something that you've put out or out of the blue that you have to um, talk to them then and there. You may want to collect your thoughts and do a f a two, two or three key messages that you want to get across. Can I call you back in half an hour? And, and that's absolutely fine, but you need to think about that access and making sure that, that you do get back. 
Um, this is one of the things that, that we most often get asked, and it's particularly true with people who've invested a lot of time in research. Will I be able to see it before it goes to print? You know, can I check the quotes? Can I check how you're using it? And the answer is probably no, um, mostly because you know, it, it's, well, two reasons really. I mean, we're all a bit precious about that, and it's no, you're not going to, you're not going to be doing a third edit of it. Um, but also it's administratively impossible, really, to have everyone looking over something you've done. Um, so as a matter of principle and policy, most publications will say no. Um, contact sharing, it's, it's quite nice to think about that because um, quite often journalists will ask you that and it's part of building the relationship of trust. If you feel able, once you've built that relationship, perhaps to um, approach people on their behalf, um, but you need to establish those, those ground rules. Um, and I really wanted to sort of finish with some of the, the benefits of building a longer term um, relationship with journalists. Once you've, you've put something out um, and you've approached a particular journalist, you've built a relationship with them, with their publication more widely, what does that do? Well, you start to be able to pitch straight in uh, comment ideas, things that you have um, a particular interest in, and you're able then to um, suggest author pieces. This is an author piece by um, uh, an individual academic who, who would write on a regular basis for Inside Housing when I was there. Um, that's uh, a piece at the top from uh, Christine Whitehead at the LSE, who was actually on my editorial panel when I was at um, one of the housing magazines that I edited and was incredibly helpful in, in terms of steering ideas for us and, and you know but also giving an idea of how you manage that relationship um, and that does lead on to um, becoming a regular columnist for a publication doing things like this I mean I think this is a really interesting example of someone who's uh, of researchers who are doing something really outside their comfort zone doing what's a journalist job really there and writing sort of bite-sized here's a primer for your readers um, about a key issue of the day. And if you have an interest in that, it's by developing those relationships, building that trust that you can, you can end up doing so. So really, um, I wanted to finish with, you know, I've given you a, a few words of caution, but I think the moral of the story is really have a bit of confidence, go out there, give it a go with building those relationships with journalists. In most cases, it is in their interests to build a positive um, relationship with you. They will come back to you once they've developed that. They will come to you for comment. Um, and that, that helps with all that profile and dissemination that we talked about. Thanks. So there's clearly still problems with um, how academics and journalists interact. You see, particularly with science reporting, like journalists just completely getting the wrong end of the stick and not giving relevant detail, etc. Um, so I'm aware of a few initiatives that have started up to try and think creatively about how we might change the, the relationships between journalists and, and academics, for example, the conversation which um, allows academics to write their own pieces with the help of a subject relevant editor. Um, I was interested in whether you see potential for, for thinking about how we might uh, create new kinds of relationships like that and maybe, you know, the stuff you were saying at the end about longer term relationships is interesting, but I wonder whether you have any further ideas along those lines. Well, I do think um, that um, in the areas that I work in, um, it's not so much a void of, of, of knowledge from the journalist's perspective. Uh, there are quite a lot of people who do build up quite a degree of specialism in working in, in social policy reporting. Um, and there isn't such a... I know that for on, on some of the scientific journals, for example, you will be expected to have a level of qualification that, that's appropriate, whereas in this field you, you wouldn't necessarily. But it is a choice for journalists in the same way that it is for people who go to work in, in those professions on the front line. It's a choice that, that we make to do that rather than do the, the doorstepping or the celeb journalism. So you have to assume a certain degree of goodwill you have to, um, but then you have to build, A, the trust, 
through developing the relationships and b offer people the opportunity for any help and support that they might need as you're working through a particular project with them um, i know that when you know i've I've had some really fruitful, and my colleagues have had some really fruitful encounters with um, the acad academic research field, being invited to go in and see what they're doing on a particular project, or to work with them when they're doing um, you know, some, some frontline research, the sort of longer term estate-based projects, things like that, where it's a, a question of going out. And as long as you... Um, have those appropriate rules in place about what's being used for publication at a particular point um, and you're happy and confident with that, I think that is something that, that, that can be really, really useful. Every university has got a comms department and for those of you who might be thinking about um, your research getting a wider audience, then they can be very helpful. I'm thinking in particular in the gap between, you mentioned the gap between a journalist maybe asking you a question and you wanting to reply as an academic. And sometimes the comms team can be very helpful in your university at helping you kind of shape the answer cause, um, and shape the kind of key questions or key ideas that you want to put across. And so as you know, don't think that as, as, as early career researchers you can't access that support because it, it is there, every university's got one and they can be worth talking to. I mean, I would add to that though that sometimes we do like to bypass the comms department oh, yeah. and the reason is because, it, because they will take longer. And once you have that relationship, I had a really good example this week because I'm doing something for The Guardian on some some survey work they've done on, on social workers and their views of the profession and, and morale within social work and so on. And I, want, I went back to um, someone who leads the social work department at Sussex, who I'd spoken to for a previous piece, had gone through the comms department, but because we'd worked together successfully on the previous piece, I'd spoken to some of her students, she was happy with it, I knew I could go, and I know it's not always protocol to, to bypass no, the comms I department. Sorry. Yeah. Absolutely. No, I, I, I entirely agree, but I'm just saying they might catch you on the hop, yeah. nevertheless. But, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kate. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.